as we move into our discussion of sensory memory, we'll see that as before, each element in the diagram represents a memory system that differs from other memory systems in function, its role in cognition, capacity, the amount of information that can be stored there, duration, the length of the storage, and anatomical implementation, the structures and neuronal processes that subserve it. Finally, each system contains multiple elements or components. Sensory memory refers to memory systems for each sensory modality, seeing, hearing, smelling, etc. More precisely, it refers to the information storage of those sensory systems themselves. The two most often studied and best understood systems are iconic or seeing memory and echoic or hearing memory. Sperling in papers in 1960 and 1967 famously studies iconic memory. Nisser in 1967 introduces echoic memory and the current names. These memory systems function one, as representational components of sensory systems, and two, as buffers to retain information long enough for attentional selection. In order to understand their duration, we have to introduce two components of each sensory memory system. Kohlhaar distinguished them and named them in 1980, but it wasn't until 1998 when work by Loftus and Ehrman separated out these two components experimentally. Sensory persistence is the persistence of non-conceptual sensory information, and it lasts approximately 50 to 60 milliseconds. Information persistence is the persistence of conceptual information and it lasts approximately 250 to 300 milliseconds. The former is implemented by residual neural activity, while the latter is the output of the visual system. These memory systems have quite large capacities, as you would expect, since there are quite large parts of our brains that are devoted to sensory processing, particularly to vision. Sensory persistence is responsible for the phenomenon called persistence of vision, thus visual trails and movies, your ability to see movies as continuous motion movies are responsible or caused by sensory persistence. Information persistence is responsible for the effects that Sperling reports. That is our ability to extract information from sensory experiences even after that experience is over. Now, Sperling did this in a number of experiments involving what's now called the Sperling matrix. It's nothing like the matrix from the movies. It's just a matrix of letters, usually three rows with three or four letters in each row. So George Sperling was a cognitive psychologist. And through several experiments, he was able to prove his hypothesis that human beings store a perfect image of the visual world for a brief moment before it's discarded from memory. He started in 1960 and he performs an experiment using his matrix. And this matrix had three rows of three letters. Participants in the study are asked to look at the letters for a brief period of time and then to recall them immediately afterwards. This technique of recall is called free recall and it showed that participants were able, on average, to recall four to five letters of the nine they were given. Now, this was already generally accepted in the psychological community, but Sperling believed that all nine letters were stored in the viewer's memory for a short period of time, but the memory failed so rapidly that only four or five could be recalled before the memories were failing. Sperling eventually would call this iconic memory. Sperling proved his hypothesis with an experiment that involved not free recall, but cued recall. In cued recall, we have a trial similar to free recall. However, instead of allowing participants to recall any of the letters, it would allow them to view the matrix for the same amount of time, then hear a pitch corresponding to different row, a different row in the matrix, so a different pitch for each row. 
the viewer was to recall the letters that corresponded to the row for the pitch that were given. On average, viewers were able to recall more during cued recall trials than free recall trials. And Sperling built upon this experiment then to determine the amount of time before information was discarded from a person's iconic memory. Using his same matrix, he allowed viewers to see matrix for the same amount of time and gave them a pitch to cue the viewer to recall the row. But now he added a twist. There was a five millisecond delay after the letters disappeared and before the cue appeared. Participants were then able to recall fewer letters than they were under the previous cued recall experiments. Thus, Sperling had shown that the visual stimuli are not added to short-term memory, but they're discarded, or at least begin to be discarded, in less than five milliseconds. Returning to this general format of the modal model, our next stop is going to be working memory. Miller famously quantified, quantifies the capacity of working memory in the form of short-term memory when working memory was thought of in a way that was much more suggestive of a more or less static representational store. He, along with Galantier and Pimbram in 1960, also introduced that term working memory. However, the most influential theory of working memory today is probably that of Alan Bailey and his colleagues. He began his research around 1974, and he's published and continues to publish even today. In the next lecture module, then, we'll look at Bailey's model of working memory, talking about each of the components and how they interact with each other.